Hey guys, this is Kim from Read It Again Bookstore. Today we have Mary Laura Philpot, one of my favoritest people and authors. Favorite person first, and then maybe favorite like author second. Um, when I read her book, which is I Miss You When I Blink, I felt like I already knew her. And then I was very happy to find out she's actually a really nice person too. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad I held up in real life. <laughs> we, um, so we, we read, she came to our store last September for um, Labor Day, but everybody was at the Decatur Book Festival, which is why you were in town. Yes. And then um, we read her book for book clubs, so our ESL book club read it, and they loved it. Like, that, loved it. That is so cool. That's one of the very coolest things that happened last year was the, the, bu the book meeting that grief group of people through mm -hmm. you. Oh, they, they loved it. Um, the thing about A Miss You in a Blink, it is probably one of the most approachable collection of essays or biographies out there. It you, you She wrote it, and she'll tell us, it's not just me saying this, that, <laughs> that you wrote it for like the average person. They just walk up. Okay, you tell the story. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell it, but you're telling, but you're telling it great. If I ever, if I, if I do get sick and I need someone to stand in for me, it's going to be you. Um, I wrote I could get my skirt and t-shirt in perfect. <laughs> you should see me now. I'm wearing exercise pants. Oh, and last time she had the cutest yellow skirt on ever. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Tell your story. Anyway, okay. So I, I wrote it. I started out writing this, this book, hoping that it would in fact become a book. I was, I write essays. That's, that is just what I write. So mm -hmm. short, like two to 3,000 word uh, autobiographical pieces. So I was writing essays and building up this stack, hoping that they would eventually build up and cohere into something that I could call a book. Um, so going into it, it, was, it wasn't that I was writing it for any particular audience or for any particular purpose other than this is what I do. I seem to be pretty good at it. I seem to be on a roll. Let me see how many I can do and, and see if it was kind of a challenge. Let me see if I can write a book. Once I got significantly through the stack, I had a good, a good stack going. Um, I started to notice that I was revisiting a lot of the same themes and a lot of the same questions. And some of the things I was writing about were, you know, if you're a very type A person and a very checklist driven person and you do all the things you need to do through adulthood and you get to the goal, whatever goal you were trying to reach professionally or personally or whatever, and you don't feel like you've made it and instead you feel kind of lost, like what's next? Mm -hmm. What do you do next? And how do you change? And how do you reinvent your life? And um, so a lot of questions about time and identity and who am I and where do I get my sense of self-worth? That's when I realized that there was an overarching theme to the collection as well as little themes in each story. And that's when I started going, you know what? I think of what I'm writing is the book I was looking for for mm -hmm. so long as a reader. And at the time, while I was writing this book, um, I worked for a bookstore. I worked for Parnassus Books here in Nashville. And mm -hmm. so I was in the store a lot and I was, uh, my job at the time was doing social media. So I was always out on the floor taking pictures of books and you know atmospheric photographs and stuff. And so I had a lot of time to observe customers kind of in their natural habitat. And I would see this thing happening again and again, which was somebody coming into the store usually a woman, not always a woman, but coming in in a hurry, you know, got the heavy purse and the keys in her hand mm -hmm. and, you know, bags under her eyes because she's tired. And she walks over to the nonfiction section and she's like, what, what, where's the thing I need? And she starts pulling down memoirs or essay collections by people who have reinvented their lives or started over in some way. And so the kind of stuff she's pulling down, she's pulling down like Eat, Pray, Love. She's mm -hmm. pulling down Wild, Wild yep, by Cheryl Strayed. Mm -hmm. All these books by, by books I love, by the way, by, great books. yeah, by great writers, by women who um, found a way to reinvent and start over. And, but what a lot of those books have in common is that the people are starting over by blowing up their lives, by like throwing a match, packing a bag, changing their name and leaving home. And, what I saw happening often in the store is that people would kind of flip through these books and then put them back and then kind of stand there. And as you know, what we're, what we are trained to do as booksellers, if we see someone in that state is to walk over and say, is there something I can help you find? And, and when I would go do that, they would say, do you have something like, like these, but, 
And I think what they were saying is, do you have something like this, but for me? Do you have a story by someone who has started over in some way or found some way to reinvent that isn't blowing up her whole life, that isn't tossing the match and burning everything down? Um, and so I started to feel, as I was observing that happening in the store and as I was writing my pile of essays, I think I might be writing that book because that's what I was writing about. It's the period of my life where I was starting to feel like, wait a second, all these goals I've set for myself, I have reached, but I don't feel the way I thought I would feel when I reached them. And I, if I want my future to feel different from my present, what am I gonna have to do? Yeah, and so when we read it, um, I read it, I made my 16 year old daughter listen to the audiobook, which which Mary Laura reads and it's really good. And then Diane who works for me, she read it. And our ages are vast. I mean, my daughter's 16, I'm in my forties, Diane's in her sixties and we all loved it. And that comes back to when we read it for our English learners book club, they all loved it. And they're from very different places than where I'm from. They're learning They're learning how to, to, to adapt to American society, but you have, one essay that really uh, talked to them, and that was when you moved to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was when my children were little, so one was a baby, and they're big now. They're like teenagers who are taller than me. But when one was a baby, baby like little baby, and one was a toddler, we went and had. We always refer to it as our family semester abroad. My husband had um, at the time he worked internationally, and he was always gone, so I was always home with the babies by myself. And he had a period of time where he was going to be in one place for a few months. So we were like, we're going to go with you wherever it is. So we can at least all be together. And it was Dublin, Ireland. And at the time, I was so entrenched in the mothering of babies, which is such an intense experience. And, you know, it only lasts a relatively short period in your life, but it it's so relentless <laughs> and you're so tired when it's happening. Um and it's so in my mind, I built up this, this trip to Ireland as really my great savior. Like this is the break I've been waiting for. The change of scenery is going to invigorate me and we're going to go see all the sights and I'm gonna be just like, you know, I had some image in my mind that we would just be like pushing the stroller, you know, on and off of trains and the babies would see castles. And you know what, babies still take naps. They take naps no matter where you are. And some of the stuff that I had prepared for, like I put so much energy into preparing the clothing that we brought. I was like, okay, everybody is going to need plenty of warm wool socks. I was obsessed with wool socks. I was obsessed with wool for some reason. I was like, we need lots of wool so we stay warm. I put all this effort into what we wore. Did not think to look up, what's the distance between the house where we will be living and the grocery store? And we're not going to have a car, so how are we going to get there? Um, so many practical things I didn't think to look into ahead of time. Also, didn't think to reach out to any people ahead of time. We landed in Dublin knowing, other than my husband's coworkers, who he saw every day, I didn't know a soul. And I, so the experience was just so different from what I had built it up to be in my mind. And I was so lonely and it was, it was one of the moments in my 30s, and this book is very much about my 30s. Um, it was one of those moments where I went, wait a second. <laughs> Sometimes I build things up in my mind to be different than they are in reality. What? <laughs> what, am I gonna, what am I gonna do about that? <laughs> and it was a time when, um, you know, I had learned, I had learned earlier in my life that sometimes when you change your scenery, it is reinvigorating. But this was a time that it, that didn't work for me. And I thought, okay, this is, maybe that, that rule doesn't always hold up. If I want my life to feel different, I am going to have to make something different. What is it going to be? There was a good parallel between this story and you talked about going abroad when you were in college. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I went to, um, I did my semester abroad at Cambridge, which was so much fun and and just one of the most fun college experiences. But one of the things that happened while I was in Cambridge is I broke up with the guy back in America who I had been dating, who was um, not a good boyfriend. Yeah, Not a good fit for me, not, um, not a good fit at all. And it was one of those relationships, I feel like everybody has one of these when they're young or maybe not even when they're young, where you know in your head, this is a poor choice but you're just in it and it's, it's a routine and you get used to it and you, and every day you wake up in the same setting and there's all the, the props, 
you know, of your life that remind you, yes, this is you. You live this life. That is the guy you are with. And this is the life you are living. And sometimes it really does take physically removing yourself from that place and from those props to go, okay, wait, I don't have to be that person. I don't have to be living that life. And that was one of the times early on where, where I learned it can help to change your scenery. Yeah. So what's the other? But can you talk about the chicken salad in the ear? It's yes. funny my earring fell off just a few minutes Ooh. ago. And I thought of you chucking your earrings. <laughs> Wait, did your, you, do you only have one on now? One. Oh, two. it's oh, on the what? floor. What's well, very cute. It's Thank like, you. it's like, boy, you, you do? do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Take note, yeah. customers. Cute earrings available. I read it again. Um, yeah, I threw my earrings after a uh, the what has come to be known as the chicken salad incident. That's what Audie Cornish called it on mm -hmm. on NPR when when she interviewed me. But it's the essay is called Sports Radio, which is a reference to sports radio, which everyone in my family loves to listen to, and I hate it so much. It just grates on my ears. I don't understand listening to people playing sports. I get watching it, I guess, but listening to it when you can't see it is crazy. And that's, I had that same sort of like, this is nonsense experience one night in that same period in my thirties where, you know, I was juggling. I had two little kids. I had a freelance writing career. I never had enough time for anything. Mm -hmm. I felt like I never got to see my friends. I never got to have real deep conversation with people about stuff that mattered. It was all small talk. And I got invited to this dinner party um, at the home of a woman with whom I shared a lot of either mutual friends or friends of friends. Like we all had kind of kids the same age or we knew each other from work once upon a time or whatever. And I, I was, again, built up this experience in my head to what it was going to be. It was going to be the great break from life. And I was going to, you know, give the kids to my husband for the night. And I was going to go talk about movies and politics and life and just things that matter. We weren't going to talk about strollers or diapers or any of that little kid stuff. We were going to talk about adult things. We sat down at that table and within the first few minutes, somebody complimented the hostess on the chicken salad that we were eating. And for the next 17 minutes, that is all anybody talked about. And I write in the essay about just the level of detail that this conversation went into. Like, do you boil the chicken or do you bake the chicken? And do you, how do we feel about celery? And and I just sat there like looking at my napkin in my, my lap, just mentally melting down going, I, I can't believe this. I can't believe all these women are around a table. We have a chance to talk about things that matter and we are dissecting a chicken salad recipe. And I went home and I, in the moment, didn't say a word. I just sat there looking at my napkin like, I can't believe this. And I went home to my husband who by the time I got home was in bed, he was sitting in bed reading and I was whispering because the kids were asleep and I was like, I can't believe why would you even have people over if you're not going to talk about things that matter? And I was pulling off my earrings and throwing them down. And then I was going and getting my toothbrush and putting the toothpaste on it. Like, this is making me so mad. <laughs> but I was so, I was so starved for connection and, and intellectual discussion. And yeah, I mean, intellectual or even emotional, anything. Just something other than children. Something, something other than the surface. Mm -hmm. of things. And this dinner party, really the conversation remained so on the surface that we were literally just discussing what was on our plate. And all I wanted was a, a deeper conversation. I was so starved for it at that point in my life. <laughs> oh my goodness. We have a chicken salad chick that's coming to our shopping center and we are so oh. excited. Speaking you know, of talking about surface things, we are so <laughs> excited. <laughs> I've never been to a chicken salad oh, chick. I've never, I've never lived near one. Oh, after that essay, I think you should become one of their their uh, spokespeople, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that Mary Laura does is a program called a Word on Words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I pulled up a link. I'm going to put it in the comments. By the way, if anybody has a question, please ask them in the comments, and oh, yeah. I would post them kind of like uh, like that. Oh, hello, hi, Christina. <laughs> Thank you. So um, can you tell us how, how that came about and what is it? Yes, it's called A Word on Words on Nashville Public Television. It actually is a show that existed 
long before I came into contact with it, for about 40 years, it ran on Nashville Public Television. It was hosted by the legendary journalist John Siegenthaler. Um, and it, in its first iteration, in those 40 years, it was a 30 minute interview show where he would interview authors of all different kinds of books. And at the end of every episode, he would look at the camera and say, keep reading. And he passed away a few years ago. And when he died, um, understandably, Nashville Public Television decided to retire the show because they felt like a show that was that tied tied up in the identity of its host just could not keep going. So they retired the show. There was no a word on words for a couple of years. And then they reimagined it and they brought it back really as a completely different thing, but with the same title and with the same sign off, we still say keep reading at the end. But now it's it's what's called an interstitial, which is not a full length program. It's a, it's a spot that runs in between other programs on public television. Public television doesn't have ads in the same way that network television has ads, but there's still space to fill between programs. So if you were to, if you live in Nashville and you were to turn on PBS to watch News Hour, but you turn it on a few minutes early, you might catch one of our little spots. And there are interviews um, with all sorts of different different authors. I am one of the hosts, and then JT Ellison, a fiction writer, is the other host, and we we trade off. So sometimes it's me interviewing someone, sometimes it's her. We're never actually we're never actually in the same place at the same time, which is funny. We're co-hosts of a show and we never see each other. Maybe you're secretly the same person. <laughs> No, maybe we are. Um, but we have a really we have a really good time. We shoot about um, 25 minutes of conversation. It's boiled down to a little four minute spot that airs. And we actually, I don't know if I'm supposed to announce this yet, but whoever is listening right now, you're the first to know. We have just found a way to capture all that great conversation that usually ends up on the cutting room floor and turn it into um, a companion piece, basically a transcript of the interview that you can read online. So if you if you see the little snippet on TV or on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, anywhere that, that it's posted, you can go to a wordonwords.org and read the whole conversation. So that's kind of fun. And we just shot our very first Zoom episode, or not Zoom, I shouldn't say Zoom episode because I don't know what, what platform we'll keep using, but our online, our first online from home remote episode the other day. This is my set. And it's this beautiful. is, yes, these are all a word on words guests word. that I have had. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is this is the new TV set. I am my own cameraman. <laughs> we have a question. Randy, um, who I just interviewed like I don't know, an hour ago for about oh, a picture book. And so, so cool. you have children's writers on your show. Mm. Very rarely. Um, we have before. I think we've had, we had Kate DiCamillo mm. and we had... I feel like there was one other one and now I'm blanking on who it is. It is, it's almost entirely adult authors. That decision is made by our producers. And I think it's mostly because of when the episodes air. Um, but that, you know, that could change. I don't know. A lot, <laughs> things are changing all the time yeah. in this right now. I mean, we have the episodes from home, who knows what we'll keep doing. Um, but we have 15, 15 episodes a year, just like any, anything in public broadcasting, it's all budget driven. So the, we have a foundation that gives money that enables us to produce the show. And it's enough money to make 15 episodes, seven or eight by one co-host and seven or eight by the other co-host. Um, and we do try to mix up different different genres and different types of, mm -hmm. of books. Now you won a Emmy for this? I did. Yes, our, our very, it's so funny. Our very first season out, which was three, se what season are we in now? I think we're in season three, maybe we're in season four, but our very first season, we won an Emmy, which was crazy. Who even knew there were Emmys for four minute long shows? But there are, uh, and we won one, which is really cool. That's and we've awesome. been nominated, we've been nominated again since. I think um, not this year or the year before. I lost track of time. What so, is time? Nobody, I don't nobody know. knows what the but, day is. Nobody, yeah. nobody. <laughs> I, I found it a little intimidating. I'm like, oh, I'm going to interview Mary Laura, who has an Emmy for interviewing people. <laughs> oh, but it's, but you, but you totally understand the secret to an interview, which is, well, it's two things. It's prepare in advance, actually know your subject, which you do. Mm -hmm. You've read the book and you know me. Everybody and twice. yeah. And you guys, everybody out there should read it twice too. <laughs> and buy two copies. <laughs> um, and you, you know, an interview really is nothing more than a conversation. 
So like, this is a fun interview for me to be on this side of, because I just feel like I'm, I'm catching up with you. You know, it's not like you're holding up cards going one question, next question, next question. Yeah. So we got a we got a comment. Hello from Alpharetta, Georgia. Really enjoyed to miss you in a blink. Oh. There is a book club that is kind of connected to us. One of our staff members is on it, and she convinced her entire book club to read your book recently. Yay! Oh my gosh, I love book clubs. One of the upsides to this bizarre situation we're in right now, and I do try to look as hard as I can for upsides, even when it seems like a situation is mostly downside. Um, Obviously, you know, this this paperback edition is brand new, just came out, mm -hmm. and there's not going to be a paperback tour. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've gotten to do so much more of that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise if I were as busy as I normally am is online book club visits. There's a little tab on my mm -hmm. website at marylaurafilpot.com, book clubs, mm -hmm. where book clubs can write in and say, you know, our book, our club is reading your book, and we meet on Thursday nights, and, you know, I talk back to them, we find a, a time to meet and I can like zoom in or Skype in or Facebook, I mean, FaceTime into their book club meeting. And I've gotten to meet so many book clubs. It's really fun. It is a lot of fun. Yeah, it's yeah, I'm, I'm like in seven book clubs. In <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, and I love it. So you read all the books for seven book clubs? <sighs> I, my, my happy months are the months that I convince the multiple book clubs to read the same thing. So Smart. and then recently I got a message from my friends. Most of my friends live overseas or not anywhere near here. And they've all decided to start a book club. And um, one of my friends, Jennifer said, oh, Kimmy, isn't this great? Your, so your personal life is starting to reflect your business life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Really? Mm -hmm. oh, that's awesome. Here, we read your book for our neighborhood book club and did a Zoom discussion. Oh, that's so great. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you, neighborhood book club. So. I was thinking about your one essay where you imagine there's another version of you out there somewhere mm -hmm. and you're, you're sacrificing right now for that person. Yes. That's my, that's my whole life philosophy. And I'm sure there is a more sophisticated version of this philosophy out there with a, a real name. Like a like, name. Yeah. Yeah. I've probably just in my mind cobbled together like a, a tiny version of something that is more thought out by somebody smarter than me. But mm -hmm. whenever, um, it's really kind of that sliding door. It's like that movie sliding doors. Whenever something bad happens in my real life, I tell myself, this is the less bad thing that I bargained with the universe for so that something worse wouldn't happen. Like, you know, if I trip and spill my coffee all over the floor, that is a bummer. But maybe in the parallel universe version of my life, something much worse was happening today. And I bargained with the universe, if you will just let this not happen, whatever it was, maybe a, a dog got run over in the street, just don't let the dog get run over the street. If you if you save the dog, I will, you can pour my coffee all over the ground, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I tell myself, because I do make bargains like that, I try to make bargains like that with the universe all the time. I tell myself, sometimes they must work out. And maybe the bad thing that I'm living through is actually the better thing that I traded the worst thing for. Gets me through. I was thinking about that the other day because I, I really think that we are living in a, like an alternative reality right now. And we just happen to have the reality with um, quarantine and um, a pandemic. Yeah. The humor out there is us not doing this. Yeah. yeah. It's, it makes you think about, um, oh my gosh, now I'm going to forget the name of the book. Did you ever read All Our Wrong Todays by Elon Mastai, M-A-S-T-A-I? It came out a few years ago and it has time travel in it, but the narrator, it's fiction, obviously, <laughs> but the narrator is speaking to the reader like, um, saying things like, I'm going to describe the world I'm living in, and you are going to think it sounds just like your world, but actually it's not because the world I was living in was much better. But then I accidentally, I time traveled and I accidentally changed something and I ended up in the world you're in, which you have no idea how much worse it is than the world that we, we had. It, it's, it's fascinating. It's that whole idea of, of different universes. And I'm not usually much of a, of a fantasy or a sci-fi reader at all. I really like realism, but my one exception is time travel. Here. I just I put that link to the book in the comments. Okay. We're about to read um, "How to Lose the Time War" Ooh. for our sci-fi book club. 
I don't so, know that one. Nicole is our manager, um, or this is how you lose a time war. I'm sorry. And Nicole, who's our manager, is um, she's got a thing for time travel. Every Halloween, she dresses up as Marty McFly. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, and, and I noticed when I pulled up the book on our website, it has a staff pick sticker on it. So I think Nicole's read it and she recommended so it. Great. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I love well, that. That's, that's our sci fi book club. That is probably our most popular book club. I love that you have multiple book clubs. Yeah, we, okay, well, we normally have more, but um, so yeah. sci fi general nonfiction just started. Uh, we were starting a suspense book club with a local pub. And okay. we were going to meet there, which was going to be a lot of fun. We started a wine book club with a local wine shop. And we were going to meet there. Then we have the English Learners Book Club and um, a teen book club. And um, yet not so young adult, young adult book club, which is our no so yeah, yeah. And that's adults reading kids yes. books. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. Um, I want to talk about penguins with people problems. Aww. Because I yeah. love this book. I, I I cracked up. This is a perfect like feel like you want to feel better and you just need something silly to read. Where's my favorite? I like the one with the suntan lotion. Oh yeah. The bronzer? The or bronzer. the one where he gets the sunburn. Oh either. Both of which are based on a true story. All those <laughs> penguins, all those penguins are me. All those penguins being embarrassed and doing stupid things are me. <laughs> This, uh, this just cracks me up. I mean, it says, um, Tina's been trying to stop cursing so much, but honestly, it's not going so damn well. <laughs> also based on a true story. Sometimes I think about that little book. That book came out in, in 2015. And sometimes I think, oh, gosh, it doesn't hold up. It's so it's so 2015. It's so of its time. It's such a it's such a book that started as a Tumblr kind of thing. But then sometimes I go back and look at it. And I'm like, no, these a lot of these are still me. <laughs> so um how did you okay so you're an illustrator too well i don't know if i can claim i i feel like i can't claim that term i did illustrate that book and mm -hmm. i do doodle a lot but i you know i don't i even if though i had a book published and it's a publish of illustrations i, I guess you can claim being okay. an illustrator. <laughs> okay well then yes i'm an illustrator <laughs> and i did not actually i did not um this is not my artwork here mm -hmm. on the cover, but I will say it is it is done by another artist off of a sketch I did. So when we were talking about um, the cover and the hardcover, hardcover, oh, you've got the hardcover. I, I was it. about to say, I can't reach it from here. My headphones will come out. So when we were talking about the, the cover and what it should look like, I drew on my iPad with my finger, which is how I illustrate things. I was like, what if we had little eyelashes like this? And they were all different colors. And I, I sent it to them and they were like, got it. And they had a, a more professional version done. But so I really, I love the cover because I do no, feel like even good. though that's not my art, it's, um, it's well, came most from authors mind. don't get that say that like what's going into their cover. They, I will say uh, Atria at Simon & Schuster were very, very kind and open to input on cover design. I, I don't know that they, expected as much input as they got. I think it's polite to send the author an email and say, do you have any thoughts on cover? And then I think maybe what the author is supposed to do is go, whatever you think is best. But I sent back a PowerPoint with nine slides. And, you know, at the time I was working in a bookstore. So like you, I was looking at books all day long. So of course I had input on covers. I had colors I liked and didn't like. I had, there were trends happening. Um, one of the trends at the time was if your book was memoir, which, you know, this is shelved with memoir, um, they would put a big cover, a, a photograph of your face on the cover. I was like, please don't put my face on it. Um, I don't like really scripty writing that you can't read or writing that looks like it's done with a marker and it's kind of streaky. I had seen so many people come into the store and squint at covers. You know, like remember Lincoln and the Bardo Mm -hmm. was really hard to read if you got a certain distance back from it. People would walk in and be like, Lincoln in the banjo. What is that? You know, so I was like, it needs to be readable from across the room. I want, I want big font, clear lettering, no question what it says. Um, so I had, and then I had samples. I was like, I like this book. I hate this book. I like this book. I hate this book. So nine slides. Yeah, were I would have, 
I would have done the same thing. I, yeah, I'm, I'm anal when it comes to that stuff. I would. It if matters. I got a cover I didn't like, oh, I'd be so upset. I'd be like, no, never mind. I don't want to publish this book. I do feel bad. I feel bad for. I have friends who have had covers that they they did not care for, and I don't know. I don't. I don't know what what it is like. I've never been in the position of having a, a cover that I hated, and then having to say, "But I hate that," and having someone tell you, "Tough beans, we're using it." But that must be hard. That would be. Um, was I going to ask you this? Oh my goodness, I had a whole list in my head. Um, pooper scoopers. Oh, talk about your next book. <laughs> oh, I, well, I wish I could. There's not. I can't tell you too much because it's still. In but the you made it announced it. Written. I did. I sold it mm -hmm. uh, based on a, a proposal and an idea. It's the first time I've ever sold a book um, that is not completely written. But I did. I had enough of a vision for what it would be, and I had started it, and it was well and you know, well underway by the time that I I sold it. And I think being in the position that I was in this time, where I have a publisher and I have an editor and a team around this book and I trust them and they've done a great job with it. And I think with the pipeline already moving, it made more sense to go, will there be a next one? Sure. Yes. Go ahead and plan on it. Um, and now I'm, now I'm in the position where I need to write it or keep writing it. It's, it's started, but um, you know, things are very different right now than they were four months ago mm -hmm. when we made that deal. And when I had been writing every day in my quiet house with nobody here because my husband was at work and the kids were at school. And now I'm writing every day with an audience and that is different. But did, but did you announce the name? Yes, it is tentatively going to be called Bomb Shelter. Yeah, Bomb Shelter is the name I put on it when I started it last year. Um, it will make sense when you read the book assuming we still call it that. If every other book that comes out in 2022 has the word shelter in the title, maybe we'll change it. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see all the stuff that comes out of this, really. Like, I, I know. you know, the babies, I don't know about the babies. The puppies. The puppies. I have a friend who's going to get pick up her puppy today. Aww. A lot of people have gotten new pets, Yeah, which is nice. Mm -hmm. So funny, because I was talking to a friend about... Um, people who are going to have kids out of this. It's not going to be people like you and I who have been married forever and have teenagers um, because that just sounds horrible, but it's going to be couples who are young and don't yeah. have kids. Yeah. Yeah. And they're so. going to be like, Oh, what would keep us busy during this time? Maybe we should have a baby. Maybe. That'll Maybe keep it'd be fun to practice having a baby. We should right. do that. <laughs> but people who have kids are going to be like, no, I don't, I don't want another body in this household. So no, I don't no. know. I've been but, taking a lot of drives, a lot of like, yeah. I'm just going to go drive <laughs> somewhere. We tried this morning, my family, my uh, kids and I tried to take a drive. We did take a drive to a farmer's market about 30 minutes away. And the, the plan was they were going to stay in the car. I was going to get out and put on my mask, which I'm going to show you my mask because I love it. I made it. It has animal faces on it. So when I wear it, I have animal faces. Oh. Isn't it great? That is so um, cute. Anyway, and I was going to get out and wait in my nice socially distanced line, six feet away from everybody, and get our produce. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so crowded and such a mob scene. And so many people jammed together. We just turned around and left. Left. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a gorgeous day here. It really is. It, it is gorgeous. And we've been kind of blessed with this weather because it's been so nice out, especially since we're not letting customers into the store. They have to stand outside. Mm -hmm. And so the weather hasn't been sucky. So they're like, OK, we'll stand out here. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to be like when it gets hot. But then you have the, Yeah. Then maybe there's like some sort of socially distanced lemonade stand or something. I was watching my dogs the other day drink water out of the bowl and I noticed my one of my dogs was socially distancing like standing six feet away <laughs> waiting in line well and done, I'm like, I know they don't know this but I feel like they know this <laughs> well I was telling you I was telling you before we went before we went live I'm in such a good mood today because my yard turtle the wild turtle who lives in my yard named Frank we only see him in the summers and then we don't see him all winter. I don't know what he does. I guess he sort of hibernates, quasi hibernates or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I, we saw him for the first time 
since last winter today. And we are, we were so excited. We were, we were going, how did you know? You knew that we missed you. And you, we, you knew that we needed you today. Like, I, I assume the animals. Know to save the day. Yeah. So um, you always have the best list of books. What are you reading right now? Oh, oh what am I reading? Let me see what's around me. Let's see what I can grab. Hold, okay, this is going to be weird. I'm lifting my computer. That's fine. I'm on a stack of books. So Ooh. you actually need the books. <laughs> I need the book. Hang on. I'm going to show you this one in particular that I really love. Oh, boy. I just made an avalanche. All my books fell on the ground. Oh, that's, that's a book a lanch. Uh, yes, I made a book a lanch. Okay, excuse me. I'm you're sorry fine. if I just made everyone seasick. No, you're okay. doing that. Um, so do you still get um, um, arcs from Panassas or... Well, I get them directly from the publishers mm -hmm. um, because I still have the show and I still have, I have a newsletter that I send out just for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it used to be weekly. Now it's kind of like twice a month, maybe once a month, but I recommend books. So mm -hmm. I still get, I still get arcs directly from publishers, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one that is coming out mid summer, I think in July. Have you read this yet? No, I haven't. I don't think I've gotten it. It's nonfiction. It's from Riverhead. Um, that's who's publishing. It. It's called Clean by James Hamblin. He is an, a doctor who writes for The Atlantic. I don't know if you ever read his columns mm -hmm. or if you follow him on Twitter, but he's really obviously very smart and kind of that unusual combination of he's very smart in a scientific book smart way, but also has a he's a great writer and he's naturally funny and he has a really good way of taking complicated information and breaking it down and making it accessible and interesting to the average person. And this book um, obviously was written quite some time ago. It's not like he wrote it right now, but somehow it is really an apt read for this time that we are living through. It's all about, it's a little bit of history, kind of the history of bathing and the history of soap and why did we start doing the things that we do to clean ourselves. And then it's a little bit of looking at where we are right now culturally with the idea of cleanliness. He kind of takes a look at the self-care industry and all the things that we put on our bodies. And then he also takes a look ahead at the future, um, understanding this the microbiome of little things that live on your skin. What would we need to do to take care of that and our health so that we stay healthy um, in, in the world that we live in? And so much of it applies to right now. I just loved it. I, I've been craving science and facts. That's what I want to read these days, um, which is not always the case for me. And so that was a good, a good one for me. That sounds good. What else? Yeah. All my other books fell on the floor. Um, what else have I read that I've loved? Ooh, I'm trying to think of books that I've read that have been uplifting. Oh wait. Okay. So this is not necessarily uplifting, but it is really good. And it just came out this week. Did you read Sea Wife by Sea Amity Wife. Gage? No. I would hold it up, except it's upstairs because I just took a really artistic Instagram shot of it by oh, my bathtub. I recognize the cover, but it, maybe if you took it and put it on Instagram, I just saw it there. It's it's brand new, like it just came out. Um, Amity Gage wrote Schroeder, which you can't see from here, but it's on the top of my bookshelf. It's a book I love that came out a few years ago. Sea Wife is about this family, a uh, mother, a father, and two little children who decide to go live on a boat for a year. And when I read it, of course, like you, I read ahead. So I read it last year in a, a manuscript and it so perfectly embodied the kind of anxiety that I have. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of catastrophic thinking and worrying about what will happen in the future. And this whole device she, she has of the family being on a boat and, and trapped in close quarters and counting down the days till this year is over and being worried about what if something bad happens, but also questioning who will we be at the end of this experience. At the time I was like, this is so, this so perfectly captures the type of anxiety I have. It's a, it's a great read for me. But now thinking about people reading this book now, it so perfectly captures all the feelings of this time. So if you are the kind of reader who likes to lean in to the emotions you're going through, not somebody who's like, I need escape. I need the opposite of what I'm living. But if you like to just lean into it and analyze it and go, why do I feel the way I feel? Mm -hmm. This story is perfect. Perfect for right now. 
one of the reasons I had my daughter read your book is because she suffers from anxiety and depression. And I love how honest you are about your anxiety in your book. So it's not something I would typically give to a 16 year old girl. Like here's a collection of essays, um, not about a child, not about a teenager, but about adult processing her emotions in her everyday life. And I was like, you have to read this. And she just loved it because oh, it was good. so good to see somebody being honest about what's going on with them. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad she did. There yeah. needs to be more, there needs to be more of that. And I yeah. feel like it's, it's, it's good to have books by people going through a variety of mental and emotional things with different outcomes. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've read a ton of books where the person is very honest about the, the mental and emotional struggle they go through and then it ends horribly, mm -hmm. or they're very honest about the struggle they go through and somehow magically they're all fine at the end. And this is, uh, I miss you when I'm like, it's not, it's neither of those things. I think at the end, the, the, the person you're reading about at the end is still the person you were reading about at the beginning, but more self-aware. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I write a lot about perfectionism and how mm -hmm. that gets, I get in my own way with my perfectionism a lot. And I'm still a perfectionist deep down in my bones, but at least I know it mm -hmm. and I'm paying attention to it. And I can kind of work around it a little bit. Where did the title I miss you where it, when I blink come from? Cause that's, that's a sweet story. Yeah. That's the, um, the very first essay in the book talks about the title. It is, I did not make it up. My child made it up when he was six years old. He was um, just scribbling and making up a little rhyme. And it was like, I miss you in the sink. I miss you in the rink. I miss you when I blink. And I saved the piece of paper that he wrote that on because I heard he was rhyming it out loud while he wrote. And I stuck it up on my office wall because um, this was back when I was a freelance writer. So I had a home office where I would sit and write every day. And I put that piece of paper up on the wall. So for years, I saw that, that little poem every day. And that line just stuck in my head. And it came to mean, it came to mean so much more obviously than he meant when he was six and he was just rhyming. Mm -hmm. It came to mean, um, it came to mean a lot of the stuff that I write about in this book, missing past versions of myself and missing um, versions of myself I intended to be but never was, and how quickly time goes by, that in a blink idea. So I miss you when I blink in my brain came to mean I miss myself. I miss the versions of me that are in here but not out here. So I'm very grateful that he came up with that title. And was he, he starting college this year? Oh, he's a junior. He's yeah. a junior in high school. school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did that go for him being finishing his junior year at home? You know, he's in a good spot. The juniors are fine. The juniors are just waiting. The sweet seniors, I feel so, I just two, feel for the seniors. seniors here that work here and they <sighs> unofficially graduated yesterday. And so we texted them, happy graduation, but that's all you can do. And I have another one who's postponed, they postponed her graduation until July. That's, I'm hearing a, a lot, a lot are having either the postponed thing or, um, you know, an online ceremony. And then the poor college seniors, I mean, what do you do in that situation, especially if you were going to college away from home? Do you even have a postponed graduation? Because are people going to come back for it? And how do they go? I know so many um, people who had college senior kids who were home for spring break when the stay at home order went into place. And so they haven't gone back to school, but all their stuff is in their dorm mm -hmm. and they're not going to go back because they're seniors. So how are they gonna get their stuff back? It's just, it's, it's complicated on so many levels and I feel so much for them. See, one thing to hear a phrase, I miss you. It's, but it's meaning, but the meaning, I'm so bad at reading aloud, but the <laughs> meaning that you embed in it with, that made it so much more meaningful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, so my goodness. So um, well, we talked about your new book. We yeah. talked about your old book. Yeah. We talked about books you recommend. Um, and I did post in the comments a link to um, a word on words. Who are you introduced? Who are you? Um, who did you just interview? I just interviewed. Where's her book? Lori Gottlieb. Maybe you should talk to someone. Oh, yeah. Really fun. Really a fun read. Uh, she is, for anybody who doesn't know about this book, she is, try not to get a glare on it. Oh, yeah. There we go. 
Yeah. Uh, she is a psychotherapist, a practicing therapist. And this book, the, the subhead is a therapist, her therapist, and our lives revealed. And she writes about um, their kind of linked plot lines. Five or four of them are about uh, clients that she has. And then the fifth plot line is herself and something that she was going through where she realized she needed the help of a therapist. And she weaves all these stories together and how she, as a therapist, helped these people kind of reimagine their own life stories. And then how has she, as, how she as a person had to kind of rewrite her own life story to make it different than it was. And she actually, the, the hardcover of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone came out the same day as I Miss You When I Blink. So she and I were on tour at the same time last year and we kept ending up at festivals together and they would always put us on a panel together because there are so many common themes in yeah. our book. So it was really fun to interview her the other day from home because I hadn't seen her. I think the last time I saw her was last year and we were in, it was either Los Angeles or Minneapolis, but but we got to spend a lot of time together last year. Yeah, I would I would pair that together. We just read another book for book club. Um, uh, oh. oh man, it's it was a, oh, 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 it was a collection of essays. It was very good. And we were drawing parallels between your book and it, um, Look Alive Out There. Oh yeah, by yeah. Sloan Crosley. I think I have yeah. that. Oh no, that's a different one. I don't have it down there. Um, I keep looking behind me because of it. All my books are behind me. Um, I like Sloan Crosley's essays a lot. Mm -hmm. So anyway, well, this Mary Laura. Fun. Yeah, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. And I always enjoy chatting with you. We, we were chatting before oh, this and I was like, oh crap, we have to go live. <laughs> we have to do this with people watching. We have to do this officially with people watching it. Um, everybody, thank you for joining us. Please support your local independent bookstore. If it's not, read it again. Find another one. Hey, if you live um, in Tennessee, go to Parnassus. They're, they're friends of ours. We like them a lot. Um, but support your independent bookstore. That's important because we need to be here. And I know you guys love us. Um, thank you. Thank you thank for coming. You. This is so much fun. I really, really enjoyed it. And it's so nice to see your face. I can't wait till I can thank see you. you again in person. And if you guys want to copy, we have them. Oh, here we go. Thank you. And um, I haven't talked to Mary Laura about this, but I'm sure we can figure out some kind of autographed book plate. Totally. I am happy to sign anything, anything you need me to do. I am at your service. We sold out of all her autographed copies a few months ago. So, yeah. Um, anyway, thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Bye.